Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ukraine the Possible, the podcast with a social justice perspective, a view from inside a nation resisting imperialist invasion, a voice in search of solidarity. The war has drastically altered Ukraine's agricultural landscape, impacting not just farmers, but the entire country. This episode focuses on Ukraine's land, agriculture, and grain in the shadow of the Russian invasion. We'll explore how the full-scale war has affected the agricultural sector, the consequences of land reform, and the challenges Ukrainian farmers face. Ukrainian agriculture has been severely damaged by the war. Three years into the invasion, about one-third of its agricultural potential is destroyed, and one-fifth of all farmland is under Russian occupation. According to Ukraine's Ministry of Agrarian Policy and Food, large areas are mined or contaminated with explosives, making them unfit for farming. Clearing these mines will take years, possibly decades, and will be very costly. Working the fields is dangerous without demining, and in deoccupied areas, agricultural workers often lose their lives due to explosive contamination. We covered this in detail in a previous episode dedicated to demining efforts. The total damage to Ukraine's agricultural sector from the Russian invasion is estimated at a staggering $80 billion, with $10 billion in assets destroyed. This includes nearly $6 billion in destroyed agricultural machinery, $2 billion in lost finished products, and $2 billion in damaged grain storage facilities. These figures highlight the extensive damage to the country's agro-industrial complex. Infrastructure destruction and port blockades have also complicated the logistics needed for exporting agricultural products. Ukraine has two main types of agricultural producers, large agribusinesses and small family farms, a common trend in post-Soviet countries. The World Bank and other international organizations refer to this as the dualization of agriculture. On one hand, Ukraine is home to some of the world's largest agribusiness corporations. On the other, these large companies operate in rural areas populated by millions of small family farms struggling to survive. Large agribusinesses, which focus on export, cultivate about half of all farmland and produce half of the gross agricultural output. With access to advanced technologies, bank loans and government subsidies, these companies can effectively compete in global markets. However, their reliance on global markets makes them vulnerable to external shocks like war or pandemics. The other half of the land is farmed by family and small-scale farms. These smaller farms produce almost all the country's potatoes and more than 80% of its vegetables, fruits and berries. They also produce three quarters of the milk and more than one third of the meat mainly for local consumption and sale at local markets. These small farms ensure the country's food security, especially in times of crisis. In the early months of the war, the blockade of Ukrainian ports in the Black Sea and the destruction of ports in the Sea of Azov caused domestic agricultural prices to plummet, worsening economic hardships for farmers. The impact of the war on export routes is immense. Before the war, Trucks delivered agricultural products to Azov and Black Sea ports, which could store large quantities of produce. Due to the port blockades, transport had to be rerouted. Trucks, railways and river barges were used to move goods. Export routes became longer, passing through the Danube and small Black Sea ports in Ukraine, Moldova and Romania, which could accommodate much less produce. Corporations managed to cover the costs associated with the blockade and benefit from the sharp rise in global prices, at least until July 2022, when a Russia-Ukraine agreement allowed agricultural exports from Black Sea ports again. This agreement helped slow the drop in grain prices. However, even those Ukrainian producers who could get their products to Black Sea ports struggled to sell at global prices because very few shippers were willing to enter Ukrainian ports without insurance causing Ukrainian prices to fall below global levels. The full-scale war has revealed the systemic vulnerability of the neoliberal agricultural model. This model focuses on global markets, 
with narrow specialization in agricultural production. It relies on international trade for food, fuel and fertilizers, and is overly dependent on producing just a few basic crops like wheat and sunflower. Ukraine's export-oriented agriculture was paralyzed in the first months of the war. Mountains of grain piled up at our borders when the Black Sea ports were blocked by the Russian Navy, and land routes were insufficient to transport the entire volume of produce. Additionally, fuel and fertilizer supplies ceased as they were previously imported from Russia and Belarus. Large agribusinesses couldn't quickly adapt to the shock and challenges of the war. Their complex logistics, technologies and large scale could be effective in peacetime, but not during active conflict. Meanwhile, family farms and small holdings, located outside active combat zones, were able to adapt relatively quickly. They began producing food for their needs, local communities, the army and the Ukrainian population. Local food systems are generally more resilient to global shocks because they rely less on external resources and international trade. As agricultural products became scarce, smallholders used more manual labor and less machinery, sometimes even working the fields with horses. They replaced chemical fertilizers with organic ones. And small export-oriented farms quickly shifted to the domestic market, producing crops like buckwheat instead of corn. But the most crucial factor was solidarity, which helps people survive the toughest times. Since local and global policies effectively abandoned rural residents to their fate, they had no choice but to rely on each other. Many rural communities took in internally displaced persons fleeing combat zones and cities often targeted by Russian airstrikes and bombings. People grew food together, shared resources and supported each other. Family and small farms fed Ukraine in peacetime and continue to do so in wartime. This has also affected public attitudes towards small-scale farming. Even before the full-scale war, many believed that the family farm model should be the future for Ukraine. Now even more people hold this view. Land reform, aimed at lifting the moratorium on the sale of agricultural land, is one of Ukraine's most contentious reforms. Let me provide a brief background. Ukraine is part of a group of post-socialist countries that underwent large-scale privatization of housing and land in the 1990s. A unique feature of this privatization was that it was free for citizens. Thus, millions of people became owners of apartments in cities and agricultural land plots in rural areas, which previously belonged to the state or collective farms. The country had a moratorium on the sale of agricultural land since 2001. This moratorium was lifted in 2020 under pressure from international organizations such as the European Union, the World Bank and the IMF. Lifting the moratorium was also a key point in President Zelensky's election campaign in 2019. Government economic advisors planned the reform in two stages. From 2021 to 2024, only individuals could buy land, with a limit of no more than 100 hectares per person. Starting in 2024, legal entities, private companies, could also purchase land up to 10,000 hectares. The main argument for land reform was that higher prices for agricultural products and land would stimulate investment and production growth. However, Critics warned that it could lead to land concentration in the hands of large agribusinesses and deepen social inequality. These concerns have become even more relevant during the war, as many Ukrainians, including farmers, have been forced to leave their homes and cannot participate in land transactions. There is a valid argument that land reform should not be carried out during the war. It is wrong to allow land sales when 30% of Ukrainian territories are occupied over 6 million refugees have left Ukraine and 5 million people are internally displaced. Not to mention that many Ukrainians, mostly men, are fighting on the front lines and cannot participate in land transactions. Moreover, the war has created uncertainty and economic hardship for many Ukrainians, leading to forced land sales. People are selling their plots out of necessity 
to buy basic goods and food or pay for medical treatment. In peacetime, they likely wouldn't sell their land. During the war, many family farms don't have the financial means to buy the land they currently lease from their neighbors. Meanwhile, large agribusinesses do have that ability. So far, we haven't seen significant changes in land ownership structures in Ukraine. The land deals happening now were mostly made long ago and are just being legalized now. However, if family farms and small holdings don't receive enough support to purchase land, we might see changes in land use in the medium term. And it's not necessarily about land grabbing by large agribusinesses. They will undoubtedly try to gain control over the land they cultivate. But there are other market players, speculators, businessmen, local mafia, oligarchs, and other non-agricultural investors who might exploit the current uncertainty to acquire parts of Ukrainian land. All this will make life even harder for family farms and small holdings. It will affect the future of Ukrainian agriculture. It could become even more industrialized and export-oriented. This, in turn, could jeopardize internal food security, as family farms and small holdings literally feed Ukraine in both peacetime and wartime. This will also impact social life in villages, as family farms and small holdings are the foundation of every village. And, of course, the environment might suffer, as industrial agriculture uses less environmentally responsible methods. However, these issues pale in comparison to the war's impact on Ukrainian agriculture, the environment and people's lives. The good news was that, in the year 2023, Ukraine managed to unblock exports via the Black Sea by creating a temporary maritime corridor. This became possible as the Ukrainian side was able to push back the Russian Black Sea fleet, which had been the main instrument in the blockade of Ukrainian ports. As a result, grain exports in April of the year 2024 exceeded pre-war levels. Unfortunately, if measured on an annual basis, the figures are significantly worse than before the war. Wheat exports for the year are projected to be 13 million tons, the lowest level in the last decade. However, even these grain export figures do not necessarily translate into direct benefits for the Ukrainian budget. The agricultural business has mastered many ways to avoid taxation, both legal and illegal. According to The Economist, about 40% of the grain harvest escapes taxation. In the media, this phenomenon is referred to as black grain. Over the past two years, Ukraine has lost about $3 billion in revenue due to such schemes. I'll briefly describe the most common ones. Let me start with the widely used scheme based on offshoring funds. This is one of the main ways to minimize tax payments achieved by underreporting export prices. Exported products are sold through offshore intermediaries. Thus, most Ukrainian grain is supplied to world markets. Meanwhile, the product doesn't actually go to the Virgin Islands or Switzerland. All transactions are on paper. This is done to hide part of the income from taxation and keep the profit on the balance sheets of offshore companies. An example from before the war can illustrate the scale of budget losses. Over six years, the state lost more than $1 billion on corn exports alone. When we talk about offshore firms, they act as intermediaries and work in these schemes for a percentage of the profit, around 2%. Companies are created to hold funds abroad, which are then closed before the currency repatriation deadline. Another loophole is the shadow farming of agricultural land. Ukraine has 42 million hectares of agricultural land, a quarter of which is state-owned. In Ukrainian conditions, this becomes a significant temptation for officials managing the land. Thus, state agricultural land is often illegally transferred for cultivation to private companies. The harvest from such lands is not reported in official records. To sell it further, it needs to be legalized. In this case, the owner might artificially inflate yields on their legal lands. As we see, official yield statistics in Ukraine can be significantly skewed. This way, the producer avoids paying land taxes and the corrupt official receives bribes for the illegal transfer of land use. Domestic practice is full of such facts. The National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine is investigating illegal deals involving 8,000 hectares of state agricultural land. 
According to preliminary estimates, the damage from corruption schemes uncovered by anti-corruption detectives in the agro-industrial complex exceeds $500 million. Around 10% of tax evasion occurs through small transactions. These include barter and cash transactions, allowing income to be hidden from the state tax service. Another reason for tax evasion is mines and unexploded ordnance. Since farmland contaminated with explosives and mines cannot be cultivated, some farmers might not declare harvest from safe fields using this pretext. These factors have made Ukrainian black grain so cheap on the European market. Such crimes also lead to huge losses for the Ukrainian budget. Over the past two years, more than $3 billion have been siphoned out of the country through black grain. And by other estimates, this figure might be even higher. To combat black grain, the government analyzes data to identify suspicious shipments and improves information exchange between investigators and customs. The government also eases currency controls, particularly improving the official exchange rate to reduce the attractiveness of transferring funds abroad. However, there is still a long way to go to fully defeat black grain. Now let's consider the risks that persist for agriculture in Ukraine. Firstly, further escalation and occupation of new territories. The Kremlin is acknowledged to be increasing its military potential. Russia's occupation of new territories could lead to a reduction in arable land. Secondly, attacks on infrastructure. Attacks on critical infrastructure facilities and damage to energy networks could lead to restrictions on electricity consumption by industrial consumers and a complete halt in production. Attacks on transport infrastructure will cause disruptions in raw material supplies and increase restoration costs. Consequently, export volumes will decrease. Thirdly, mobilization and migration abroad. Increasing the scale and pace of mobilization could exacerbate the shortage of human capital, reduce productivity and increase labor costs thereby reducing export activity of enterprises. Already, agricultural enterprises face restrictions on production expansion due to a labor shortage, prompting them to hire more women. Fourthly, blockade of the western border. The blockade of the border with European Union countries led to a reduction in exports by road and a decrease in customs revenues to the state budget. Therefore, a resumption of the blockade could lead to delays in deliveries to foreign customers, reductions in shipment volumes, and increased transport costs. Fifthly, the introduction of restrictions, or the elimination of preferential trade conditions. The suspension of all import duties and trade protection measures by the European Union for Ukraine in the spring of the year 2022 became a lifeline for Ukrainian agricultural producers. The EU has already extended the preferential trade conditions twice, most recently in March of the year 2024, but with conditions to protect its agricultural market. A refusal of preferential trade conditions or the introduction of trade restrictions could reduce export volumes due to limited market access. A refusal of preferential trade conditions or the introduction of trade restrictions could reduce export volumes due to limited market access. Sixthly, the closure of the temporary maritime corridor. This would return Ukrainian agricultural exporters to the state of the summer of the year 2023 when Russia withdrew from the grain agreement and an alternative maritime route was not yet secured, although Ukraine was then developing other transport routes via the Danube or through ports in Romania and Poland, closing the corridor could lead to significantly increased delivery times and costs as well as a reconfiguration of logistics chains that would be less efficient. Agricultural exports critically depend on the ability to transport by sea. Even if we imagine that the challenges of wartime are behind us, the Ukrainian government faces a serious dilemma. The question is whether to continue supporting the large-scale, export-oriented model of agriculture, which is lobbied by big businesses and oligarchs and remain the breadbasket of the world. Industrial export-oriented agriculture has shown its vulnerability and instability. An alternative might be to shift focus to family farming, which is socially, environmentally, and economically more sustainable and more resilient in times of crisis. After the Euromaidan protests in the year 2014, small landowners hoped that Ukraine's association with the EU and then its full membership would reduce corruption and weaken oligarchic influence on the domestic economy, open new markets for farm products, 
and support the development of family farming in Ukraine. In general, it was expected that EU membership would mean a better life and fairer opportunities for many Ukrainians, not just rural residents. Family farms can become the foundation for sustainable rural development, providing food security and economic stability. Support for small farms can include access to credit, subsidies, technology and markets. If supported, they can become a sustainable alternative to industrial agriculture, which relies heavily on fertilizers and pesticides. The government also needs to consider the environmental aspects of agriculture. Family farms usually employ more environmentally responsible farming methods, contributing to the conservation of natural resources and biodiversity. Investments in sustainable and eco-friendly farming methods can promote long-term development of the agricultural sector and improve the quality of life in rural areas. The political response to this complex issue will determine the future of Ukrainian agriculture and rural areas in the coming years. This podcast relies on credible sources, which are detailed in the description. For further reference, you can access the materials through the provided links.